though only eight years old when he entered the temple, he was by nature and education extremely precocious. His memory retained everything, and his sensitiveness comprehended everything. His features recalled the somewhat effeminate look of Louis XV and the Austrian auteur of Maria Teresa. His blue eyes, aquiline nose, elevated nostrils, well-defined mouth, pouting lips, chestnut hair parted in the middle and falling in thick curls on his shoulders, resembled his mother before her years of tears and torture. All the beauty of his race, by both the scents, seemed to reappear in him. For some time, the care of his parents preserved his health and cheerfulness, even in the temple, but his constitution was weakened by the fever recorded by his sister, and his jailers were determined that he should never regain strength. Simon and his wife cut off all those fair locks that had been his youthful glory and his mother's pride. This worthy pair stripped him of the mourning he wore for his father, and as they did so, they called it playing at the game of the spoiled king. The child was punished for sensibility, rewarded for meanness, and his vices encouraged. They alternately induced him to commit excesses and then half starved him. They beat him mercilessly, nor was the treatment by night less brutal than that by day. As soon as the weary boy had sunk into his first profound sleep, they would loudly call him by name. Gapé! Gapé! Startled, nervous, bathed in perspiration, or sometimes trembling with cold, he would spring up, rush through the dark, and present himself at Simon's bedside, murmuring, tremblingly, I am here, citizen. Simon would buffet him on the head, or kick him away, adding the remark, Get to bed, wolf's cub. On one of these occasions, when the child had fallen half-stunned upon his own miserable couch, and lay there groaning and faint with pain, Simon roared out with a laugh. And suppose you were king, Gabbe? What would you do to me? The child thought of his father's dying words, and said, I would forgive you. Yet when Simon was removed, the poor prince's condition became even worse. His horrible loneliness induced an apathetic stupor to which any suffering would have been preferable. He passed his days without any kind of occupation. They did not allow him light in the evening. His keepers never approached him but to give him food. And on the rare occasion when they took him to the platform of the tower, he was unable to move about. The swellings at his knees alone were sufficient to disable him from walking. When, in November 1794, a commissary named Gouman arrived at the temple, disposed to treat the little prisoner with kindness, it was too late. For a long time, the unhappy child had been shut up in the darkness, and he was dying of fright. He was very grateful for the attentions of Gouma, and became much attached to him, but his physical condition was alarming, and owing to Gouma's representations, a commission was instituted to examine him. One of these commissioners approached the young prince respectfully. The latter did not raise his head. Another, in a kind voice, begged him to speak to them. The eyes of the boy remained fixed on the table before him. 
They told him of the kindly intentions of the government, of their hopes that he would yet be happy, and their desire that he would speak unreservedly to the medical man that was to visit him. He seemed to listen with profound attention, but not a single word passed his lips. It was an heroic principle that impelled that poor young heart to maintain the silence of a mute in presence of these men. He remembered too well the days when three other commissaries waited on him, regaled him with pastry and wine, and obtained from him that hellish accusation against the mother that he loved. He had learned by some means the import of that act, so as far as it was an injury to his mother. He now dreaded seeing again free commissaries, hearing again kind words, and being treated again with fine promises. Dumb as death itself, he sat before them, and remained motionless as stone, and as mute. At last he suffered so much that his keepers carried him about to the top of the tower. But the slight improvement to his health occasioned by the change of air scarcely compensated for the pain which his fatigue gave him. Whenever the child was brought out upon the platform, he saw a little troop of sparrows, which used to come and drink and bathe in the reservoir. At first they flew away at his approach, but from being accustomed to seeing him walk quietly there every day, they at last grew more familiar and did not spread their wings for flight till he came up close to them. They were always the same. He knew them by sight, and, perhaps like himself, they were inhabitants of that ancient power. He called them his birds, and his first action when the door into the terrace was opened was to look towards that side, and the sparrows were always there. He delighted in their chirping, and he must have envied them their wings. Though so little could be done to alleviate his sufferings, a moral improvement was taking place in him. He was touched by the lively interest displayed by his physician, Monsieur Dussault, who never failed to visit him at nine o'clock every morning. He seemed pleased with the attention paid him, and ended by placing entire confidence in this Dussault who prolonged his visits as long as the officers of the municipality would permit. When they announced the close of the visit, the child, unwilling to beg them to allow a longer time, would hold him back by the skirt of his coat. Suddenly, Monsieur Dussault's visits ceased. Several days passed and nothing was heard of him. The rest of the keepers soon told him, you must not expect to see him any more. He has died. Monsieur Payton, head surgeon of the Grand Hospice de l'Humanité, was next directed to attend the prisoner with the rest of the keepers. On their arrival, they heard that the child, whose weakness was excessive, had had a fainting fit, which had occasioned fears to be entertained that his end was approaching. He had revived a little, however, when the physicians went up at about nine o'clock. Unable to contend with increasing exhaustion, they perceived there was no longer any hope of prolonging an existence worn out by so much suffering, and that all their art could effect would be to soften the last stage of this lamentable disease. While standing by the prince's bed, Gourmand noticed that he was quietly crying, and asked him kindly, what was the matter? I am always alone, he said. 
My dear mother remained in the other tower. Night came. His last night. Which the regulations of the prison condemned him to pass once more in solitude with suffering his old companion only at his side. This time, however, death too stood at his pillow. When Gourmand went up to the child's room on the morning of the 8th of June, he said, seeing him calm, motionless and mute, I hope you're not in pain just now. Oh yes, I am still in pain but not nearly so much. The music is so beautiful. Now, there was no music to be heard, either in the tower or anywhere near. Gourmet, astonished, said to him, From what direction do you hear this music? From above. And have you heard it long? Since you knelt down, do you not hear it? Listen, listen. And the child, with a nervous motion, raised his faltering hand as he opened his large eyes illuminated by the light. His poor keeper, unwilling to destroy this last sweet illusion, appeared to listen also. After a few minutes of attention, the child again started and cried out in intense rapture. Amongst all the voices, I have distinguished that of my mother. These were almost his last words. At a quarter past two, he died. The poor little royal corpse was carried from the room where he had suffered for so long. From this apartment, his father had gone to the scaffold, and thence the son must pass to the burial ground.